Thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, please, uh, if we could get started. Uh, Tim Campbell has been interested in astronomy for as long as he can remember, but he became completely hooked after observing Saturn's rings through a telescope when he was about 19 years old. Here at Cranbrook. Here at Cranbrook. He's also a member of the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club since 2011. We won't hold that against him. He enjoys public outreach, and he is a planetarium presenter slash operator at Henry Ford College. No longer satisfied to merely enjoy viewing objects of the night sky, his interests and passions have steered towards understanding the physics of the cosmos. Without further ado, I give you Tim Campbell. Okay. All right. Uh, so there's a folder of uh, diagrams that you can uh, take one and pass it along. Okay. This is a, um, a presentation I gave a while ago to the Ford Club. It takes. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Does it sound good? Do I need to? I can, I can lean in if I need to. So um, this is a presentation I gave to the Ford Club um, a while ago. I tweaked it just a little bit. Um, as, I, as I go through this, um, this slide is really just to call attention to the fact that uh, there's a way that I kind of explain some of the concepts that I'm going to go through. And when I do this, um, it turns out I occasionally lie. Uh, I do this for a reason. Uh, I'm going to try and simplify some concepts. I'll tell you after I'm finished lying to you that I lied, so don't worry. I won't, I won't actually leave with you like thinking the wrong thing. Um, so we'll go through uh, some stuff about the speed of light, what we, what we always thought about the speed of light, and what we've ultimately learned about the speed of light, and then the, the consequences of that. Um, there'll be a little bit of math, uh, not, not too heavy, uh, though, so don't worry about that, and, and, I, and I do it for you. Uh, but as a result of the presentation, I'm actually going to show you how you can do some cool calculations without actually doing any math at all. So that's kind of neat. Um, so we start out um, with this idea here, which is that light travels without delay. Right? So, so who thinks that? Uh, so it, it turns out uh, Aristotle thinks that. Uh, now Aristotle also thinks that if you drop two objects at the same time, that the heavier object will fall faster than the lighter object. Uh, in, in proportion to their difference in weight. So a 100-pound cannonball falls to the ground 100 times faster than a 1-pound cannonball. Um, that's a great idea. It turns out nobody bothers to check for nearly 2,000 years. <laughs> so, so not everything that Aristotle comes up with turns out to be right. Um, but hey, uh, Rene Descartes thinks so. Um, and also um, Giovanni Cassini thinks so as well. Uh, and, and it turns out they're not alone. Lots and lots of people think that light actually travels without delay. But there is one holdout, and we'll get to that holdout. Uh, this guy, in point of honesty here, when I gave the presentation to the Ford Club, uh, the S in his name is missing. His name is going to appear throughout the presentation from time to time. And uh, so it was Sir Isaac Newton. I guess that was Isaac's brother. And nobody in the audience pointed out to me that I had a typo on all of my slides, uh, or were either too polite to. Um, to, to say so. Uh, so here's his idea. He's not so sure that light travels without delay, so he's going to do a little science and see if he can figure it out. Um, and so here's the idea, and I'm going to sort of animate this. What he needs is, is two hills or mountains. They need to be very far apart. These are not probably the mountains. Um, I just swiped a slide, or, or swiped a picture that I could use. I added these lanterns up here. He has to have two people go up to the tops of these hills with some lanterns. They also need some cards here. Uh, so the purpose of this card and this card, and this would have been done at night, is to make sure the person on the other hill cannot see the lantern. Now, when he gives a signal, he's going to start timing this, and the first person drops their card, allowing the light to shine to the lantern on the top of the second hill. As soon as that person sees the light from this lantern, they will drop their card, allowing the light to return. And he will measure the round trip time. And he does this over and over and over, and concludes Either light actually does travel without delay, or his measurement tools simply are not fast enough. So maybe there is a delay. So to his credit, he doesn't completely concede that light is instant, but he is unable to measure anything. All right. Uh, so um, 
Anybody read uh, David Sorbel's book, uh, Longitude? Anybody? Not that, a few of you, okay. So, um, so this is the, uh, a little bit of the story of, of solving the longitude problem. Um, if you want to know what your latitude is, that's pretty easy. You use one of these little devices uh, called a sextant. It's called a sextant because it is one sixth of a circle. So if you imagine putting six of these together, uh, you would get a 360 degree circle. So you use one of those and uh, you pick an object that you know what its altitude needs to be uh, as measured from some known point on the Earth. And then you see what your, uh, some known latitude on Earth. And then you measure what your angle actually is. And that difference is um, your difference in latitude. So if you know what it should have been if you were at the equator, uh, you can figure out uh, what your latitude is north or south of the equator based on that. Okay, finding the longitude problem though, that's a little bit more difficult. The problem with the longitude problem is, um, suppose you know that uh, you know, on today, February 4th, uh, that uh, Sirius will be 60 degrees above the eastern horizon at 9 p.m., right? I I'm making this up, right? Well, what you need to do is you need to know where you would have to be standing for it to appear that high. You also need to know what time it is. Uh, and then you have to know, um, you know, you're someplace else, how far away you don't know, but you're gonna use the sextant once again to measure the angle and you do know what time it is, uh, and so you can figure out the longitude problem. The problem is the accurate clocks of the day have these little gizmos inside them, these long clocks that require pendulums. And although, don't accuse me of being Aristotle with you know, saying something without testing it, but I've never actually tested this. I suspect long clocks don't work very well on ships on the ocean, just, just, a, just a guess. If you don't know your longitude, it's entirely possible that this will happen to you when you're at sea. And it turns out that's precisely what does happen. In fact, it's happened more than once, uh, but the famous incident uh, is uh, Sir Cloudsley Chevelle, um, the silly naval disaster of 1707. So they had had a victory uh, at war, they're returning back to England. Uh, he's rounding a point uh, keep in mind the year, the electric light has not been invented, and uh, they're rounding a point, at least they think they're rounding a point, and they miss. And the entire fleet runs aground and ship and, uh, and sinks, and everybody dies. And so this is an outrage. And so they, they press the crown, you have to solve this problem. So thus is formed the Board of Longitude. Uh, if you read Davis Orbell's book, um, there are lots of humorous stories of the, yeah, so, so the prize is a king's ransom, uh, which is uh, basically an amount of gold, a quantity of gold, it's worth quite a lot of money, uh, to anyone who can solve the problem, and there was a scale to it. So uh, the more accurately you could calculate longitude to, to a degree of certainty, uh, the, the greater the prize was worth, the less accurate, the less the prize would be worth. Uh, so people came up with kooky ideas. Uh, one of them was, um, sympathy powder and dogs, and uh, they would torture a dog on land in the home port, uh, and then somehow, um, psychically, the dog on the other dog, that was like psychically linked to the first dog on the ship at sea would yelp at the same time, and you would know what time it was. I'm not making this up, this is in the book, right? So, a lot of crackpots um, came up with, with strange ideas. Um, but this guy, uh, comes up with an idea. Now notice that this guy is, is, he's gone before the Board of Longitude is formed. So he's not actually submitting his idea to the Board of Longitude, but Isaac Newton is on the Board of Longitude and, uh, and knows uh, about Galileo's idea. So he thinks that this is one of the things that they should try. And so Galileo's idea is based on the, the Jupiter and the Galilean moons. Um, and the fact that after studying them, uh, they have pretty good, well-known timings as they go around uh, Jupiter. Uh, the one that they're particularly interested in is EO, because EO orbits roughly every 42 and a half hours. Um, the actual amount of time is known uh, down to the second. Okay, so the idea is, is EO uh, goes around the um, uh, Jupiter. Uh, you'll, you'll wait for this to happen. We're, we're, we're going to have a, a table with all the timetables of when it's going to go behind Jupiter and pop out the other side. Uh, Dale Parton will vouch for how easy it is to do this. Um, and, uh, and, but Dale had the easy version of it uh, because in this version, you will do it while on a ship pitching and rolling at sea. Um, because being on solid ground is not a challenge. So um, you need a gadget for this. 
so this, uh, this is a telescope that you wear on your face. Um, anybody have one of these? <laughs> I don't have mine. Uh, it's called a Chaletone. Um, it is the, uh, the, the gadget they invented for this. The idea is that it's easier to keep your, your head, you know, if the, if the ship is doing this below you, your head will probably stay relatively still. Galileo has an idea that basically that the observer will sit in a gimbal type gadget, a hemis two hemispheres, basically a, a large hemisphere, put a bunch of oil in it, a smaller hemisphere floated on that pool of oil, and the observer is sitting in a chair inside it. So as the ship is doing this, that gimbal device will remain relatively still, and then they're wearing the chalatone on their head, and, uh, and they will be able to make this observation. It sounds easy, right, Dale? And so anyway, um, can't wait to try. So, um, okay, so uh, the idea is then, so now that you're wearing this, you simply wait for Io to be occulted by Jupiter, and then we go, it pops out, in the, and, and pops out of the shadow, and then you have your time measurement. Now, it does need to be dark, and it does need to be clear. And so, as Dale will attest, um, it doesn't always happen in the dark, and it doesn't always happen when it's clear. But when it does happen, you know exactly what time it is, um, and so based on that, you know what time it is, <coughs> Uh, you can now use your sextant and measure the angle, and you have thus solved the longitude problem. Easy, right? Uh, they test it. It's not so easy. So um, what they discover is that as Io is going behind Jupiter and then pops out the other side, uh, remember, they don't have computers, so these are paper charts that they've made for years. Um, you know, 42 and a half hours, another 42 and a half hours, another 42 and a half hours for years in the future. Um, and what they discover is it is not obeying the rules of orbital mechanics. So I was sometimes early, I was sometimes late. Um, and they're wrapped with why does this moon speed up and slow down? And by the way, they're pretty sure the moon is speeding up and slowing down. Because as we know, light is instant. Um, there he is. So, Ali Romer is our hero. Uh, Ali notices a coincidence. And here is the coincidence. I'll illustrate it for you. So I have a little picture of the sun. I put Jupiter over here. We'll add an Io. I'll put the Earth there and Earth orbiting the sun. And so when Earth is here, the occultations occur as expected, as predicted by the tables. But when Earth is over here, well, probably more like over here or over there, not probably over there, but I was late, um, perhaps eight minutes. And when I with Earth, I'm sorry, I said I see, I'm misspeaking already. When Earth, because <laughs> I was over here, uh, when Earth is over here, now we're early. And so Rover notices this and says, wait a minute, maybe I was not speeding up and slowing down. Maybe it's taking longer for light to get across the solar system. And so there is a speed of light. He comes up with a guess. Uh, it's wrong. Uh, it turns out this predates the transit of Venus. So we don't actually know how far away Earth is from the sun. But he comes up with a guess, and it's pretty good. His logic is sound. Um, so eventually, uh, his wisdom does prevail that there is actually a speed of light. So one problem solved. Now, we don't know what the speed of light is, but one problem is solved. Uh, the next thing is, uh, what is the nature of light? Okay, is it a particle or a wave? And the smartest guy in England says it's a particle. And he has this book, Optics, and I, 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 didn't, read, I didn't read his paper, but um, the idea is based on the fact that he knows that the gases are getting thinner and thinner. You know, climb up to the top of the mountain, the gas is thinner. Um, so he reasons that space probably does not have uh, air. And all waves need some sort of a medium to propagate through. Sound needs air, uh, waves on water need water. Uh, so you have to have a medium. Um, and there is no medium in space, therefore there can be no waves in space, so it must be a particle. Meanwhile, Thomas Young has a different idea. He he builds this double slit experiment, the original double slit experiment. Actually, you can almost call it the triple slit experiment. What he does is he's got the double slit there, which you're probably familiar with the double slit idea. He puts another slit in front of the other two slits. Uh, he does this because, anybody want to guess why he does this? So keep in mind the year. 
Um, I'm holding a laser. You could do a double slit, double slit experiment if you had a laser. He doesn't have a laser. Um, and so he needs, if you've got multiple wavelengths of light uh, and the light is not parallel, you're not going to get a wave interference pattern. So he puts a slit in front of the other two slits to create um, parallel light. Um, I didn't find out if he put a prism in front of it as well, but I would think that he would have had to have. Um, because otherwise, you know, the full spectrum, you get all sorts of interference that wouldn't work out. Uh, but regardless of how he does it, he is able to show that there is a wave interference pattern. And so he concludes that it is a wave. Uh, years later, oh, so actually, no. Demonstration on waves. Uh, hopefully the sound works here. Okay, so here's a wave. It's a very simple wave. This is just x is the sine of y, so that's a very simple sine wave. Um, it's kind of a boring wave, it's a long wave. You wouldn't be able to hear that wave if we played it. So I'll speed up the tempo a little bit. So x is the sine of y times 10, and I get a little more active wave. There we go, sorry, and I'll turn that down a little bit. Um, all right, so that's, that's our wave. Actually, I'll turn it down a little more. All right, so that's our wave that we get uh, with, a, with a sine wave pattern. Um, now we'll do another one. And this time, it's x is uh, the sine of y times 11. Uh, so it's a little bit more frequent wave. And listen to this one. Right. Okay, so the pitch is a little bit higher, right? So it's a little bit more energetic wave, a little bit higher pitch. What happens if we play them both at the same time? Uh, so this is the sine of y times 10 and the sine of y times 11 graphed at the same time. You can see that in the middle here, uh, the waves are on top of each other, and they are also over here, and they are also over there. But in this middle bit, they're basically out of phase with each other completely. They're opposites, and they're opposites here, and they're opposites there, and they're way over there, they are as well. Um, so the idea is um, you can add these up. Um, I swear to you, that was not a special effect. All I did was I took a computer and I generated a tone. I generated a slightly higher tone. I went into GarageBand and I told it to play both the tones at the same time. And it just sounds like that, right? And the reason it sounds like that is because if I actually graph it, this green pattern that you see here is both of the waves. So this is literally, you punch this in in your graphing calculator. X is the sine of Y times 10 plus sine of Y times 11. And you'll get that green line. It gets bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. Actually, let me clear out the mess. So you have just that, and that's what you get. Louder, quieter, louder, quieter. And I'll play it again. And there you go, that's wave interference. But this is wave interference that you can actually hear with your ears. So what we're trying to get to is wave interference that you can see with your eyeballs. Okay, so waves require a medium. Christian Huygens, uh, redoes the double slit experiment, and I'm going to do a slower animation of how this works. So here's our waves propagating, you see them intersecting here and here and here. And what I want to do is draw some lines through these. So at each intersection point, I have a line, an arrow going through. These intersections get another one, these intersections get another one. And notice that where the intersections hit, that's where you see the bright spots. There, 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 going through the intersections. These are the troughs between the waves where they zigzag. And so in these troughs, they're canceling out, and that's where you get the black spot, right? So this is a visualization of the wave interference pattern of light. Now, I, okay, so I, this one is yellow, and that one is green, and if you're really going to do the experiment, they need to be the same wavelength. Um, so I'm just doing the different colors to make it easier for your eyes to see what I'm up to, um, but that's the general idea. So he confirms Young's idea about the wave nature of light. So light appears to be a wave after all, but... Remember what Isaac Newton said, waves require a medium. So, no problem, let's invent a medium. So, uh, they invent the luminiferous ether. And problem solved. So, a little bit of time goes by. I, we proved it, it's got to be there, right? A little bit of time goes by, and uh, the idea of the luminiferous ether, actually, let me just explain the concept. So, I got the sun, I got the earth. Um, the Earth is going around the Sun, the Sun is going around the galaxy, the galaxy is probably going someplace. Actually, in these years, they don't know that there's a galaxy, and that, you know, more than one galaxy out there. But, uh, but they do realize that things are in motion, and so we must be moving through this thing. They know roughly how far the Earth is from the Sun by this point, and uh, based on that, they know about how fast the Earth must be going through space. It goes around the Sun. 
said, well, we should be able to measure a difference. We should be able to see that light is, uh, actually, let me just draw it. it. So I've just drawn the luminiferous ether in some arbitrary direction. It doesn't really matter. I drew it from left to right. I put some seasons on, the, um, uh, on our orbit. Um, the idea is, is if we're going this way, we're going in upstream against the ether, so we should see light coming at us faster. Over here, we're going downstream through the ether, um, so we should see light propagating more slowly, right? Because we're now we're, it's like going down the river versus going up the river, uh, and that's the idea. Um, some other ideas is that um, the we know that light is very very fast. Sound travels faster through water than it does through air by, don't hold me to it, but I think it's 25 times. Um, and that's because water is more dense. And so light travels significantly faster than that. So whatever this ether is, it must be incredibly dense. Also, uh, playing a high note um, you know, on a guitar string requires more tension than playing a low note on a guitar string. And light has very high frequency and so um, we know that this must have, you know, must be very rigid to have high frequency, must be very dense uh, to travel quickly. So that's what they're expecting to see. All right. So the Michelson-Morley experiment uh, comes up, and these two guys decide they're going to put it. They're, they're going to solve this problem. They're going to detect the luminiferous ether, um, and they build a gadget called an interferometer. Now their interferometer is based on the speed that we know that the Earth is going roughly 30 miles per second, uh, I don't know, kilometers. Um, actually, I'm not sure. Don't quote me on it. I think it's kilometers per second around the sun. And their experiment is able to detect even just one kilometer per second uh, difference. So their, their experiment is 30 times more sensitive than it needs to be um, to detect um, this luminiferous ether that we're going for. So they build the interferometer, the idea is uh, light comes in, gets split, part of it goes down that path, part of it goes down that path, they rebounce off the mirrors and come together. Um, this part is going one way through the luminiferous ether, that part is going 90 degrees away across the luminiferous ether. Um, this should allow them to measure that there is a difference. Um, this is actually a photograph of the gadget, it's floating on a pool of um, mercury. They're floating the whole experiment on mercury uh, for stability. Um, and the answer is, there is no answer. The greatest null result uh, in, in the history of science. They expected to find a difference and they saw nothing. Um, they tried the experiment at different times, they tried the experiment in different places, different people tried the experiment, they tried all kinds of things. No matter what anyone does, they cannot ever detect uh, a difference. But this creates a new problem, because if you can never detect a difference, if, if I'm driving down the road in a car at 10 miles an hour, and I roll the window down, and I'm holding a baseball, and I heave the baseball forward also at 10 miles an hour, then to a person on the side of the road watching me driving toward them, hurling this baseball, the baseball is coming at you at 20 miles an hour, right? You can add it up. Except that if the baseball is light, it comes at the same speed. So if I'm the guy in the car, I threw the baseball out the window at 10 miles an hour, and if I'm standing on the side of the road, it's coming toward me also at 10 miles an hour, and it does not matter how fast or slow the car is going, or even if the car is reversed, it still comes at you at 10 miles an hour. So wrap your mind around that, right? But this is precisely what the light is doing. So this nullifies the Huygens hypothesis. Um, the ether is out. Okay, so um, do a quick checkpoint here. Um, two, 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 okay. um, so in my checkpoint, so we've detected now that light definitely has a speed, check. Um, we also detected that light, uh, I didn't get into the particle light behavior, I skipped that part, but we did detect that it is definitely a wave. Um, and we also were able to prove that light is apparently propagating through space and does not require a medium. Um, so, and then lastly, we stumbled onto this notion that the speed of light is always measured to be the same, no matter, no matter how you do the experiment, it will always be the same, right? Okay, so Einstein comes along, and in 1905, uh, he puts out his paper on special relativity um, on the electrodynamics of moving bodies, right? So um, his postulates are, number one, the laws of physics are the same for everyone, and number two, 
Um, the speed of light is always measured to be the same for everyone. And I've added in everyone, everywhere, and every when. And you'll see why I added in every when in a, in a moment. Uh, but what this does is it reconciles Maxwell's equations um, with the laws of mechanics, right? So uh, he is not yet tied in uh, gravity. Um, did I just get the slide to repeat? Yeah, somehow I backed up the slide and flip it through. So he's tied um, electromagnetism together um, with, with the speed of light uh, and the laws of mechanics, but not, not gravity, right? So uh, doing gravity uh, requires also um, general relativity. I don't really get into general relativity. Depending on how much time is left over, uh, I can talk just a little bit about some, some tweaks to this based on general relativity. Um, but I'm trying to keep this simple. So it's special because it does not account for gravity. Okay, so in general relativity, this is the field equations, um, does finally reconcile gravity. Uh, not going to cover that, uh, but I love this quote by John Wheeler, space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve. So what I'm saying works out is that uh, the only way you get this, um, the speed of light is always going the same, no matter what someone is doing, is that people are not actually experiencing time at the same rate depending on their frame of reference. And that's the only way it works. Um, now that sounds like an insane idea, but there's actually quite a substantial amount of evidence that that's precisely what's going on. Okay, so uh, how many of you have heard of Herman Minkowski? Anybody? Yay. So a few of you. Okay, yeah, good. How, how many have not heard of Herman Minkowski? Okay, so a few of you. All right, so. Herman Minkowski is one of Einstein's tutors, um, but, um, or mentors, I should say. Um, probably Einstein is the greater genius, but Minkowski is the better mathematician. So he's looking at the equations that Einstein has come up with, and he's realized that he can kind of simplify this, but he also realizes that he can sort of graphically represent this four-dimensionally and then sort of spin the graph around for different frames of reference. Um, and so that was kind of a, a cool idea that Minkowski comes up with. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about space-time. Uh, so I did mention at the beginning that there would be just a little bit of math. <laughs> um, this is the space-time interval. And so the equation for the space-time interval is delta s, which is that's the space-time interval, STI is the square root of c, the speed of light, times the delta t, difference in time, squared minus delta x, the difference, distance in position, also squared. Okay, so you're not gonna need to memorize that. There are several different ways, right? So you can play all you want with the math and moving things around and following rules. Um, we'll get to that. Okay, so um, I'm gonna make a little bit of an analogy here. So I have a simple piece of graph paper, uh, 10 minutes up, 10 minutes east, we'll call the units miles, I don't really care what you call them. Um, you're gonna get on a bicycle and you're gonna go for a little ride. And you are going to start at our origin point down here and you're gonna ride your bicycle 10 miles per hour, heading due north, and you're gonna do this for exactly one hour. And then you're gonna stop. And the question is, at the end of one hour, how far north are you? This is not a trick question, right? 10 miles. 10 miles, right? Pretty easy, right? Not a trick question, okay? How far east are you? Zero. 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 Not at all, right? Pretty easy, right? Okay, so reset back to the origin point. Do it again, this time travel east instead of north. End of one hour, you're 10 miles east, right? Okay, here comes the tricky bit. Now travel 10 miles per hour due northeast. So you go this way for one hour, okay? At the end of one hour, right, by the way, uh, this is not a cheat. I literally took that object there, I copied it and pasted it, changed its color to orange, and then told the computer to rotate it on a 45 degree angle and I set the origin point back to the same spot. So this, at this object here, this object here, and this object here are actually just clones of each other that have been rotated and, and clones have been changed. So that's actually how far you get in one hour. So it's about seven miles. Technically a little bit more than seven miles, not by much, um, but, but a little over seven miles north, also a little more than seven miles east after traveling diagonally for an hour. So uh, keep that in mind. All right, so now we're gonna do it again, but we're gonna change the labels. Same graph, 
Uh, but this time I'm going to put time on this axis, and I'm going to put space on that axis. I'm going to call these years, and I'm going to call these units light years. And I could have picked any units that I wanted, but it turns out the math is a lot easier if we use years and light years, and you'll see why. Okay, so we get on our um, uh, uh, bicycle, and we do nothing. We sit still for one year without moving. This would be a good time to take a bathroom break before you start that. Um, don't move, or you'll ruin the experiment. All right. The question is, after sitting still for one year and not moving, uh, how far have you moved through time? One year. One year. You've moved one year through time. How far have you moved through space? Zero. You didn't move, right? That's easy enough, right? Okay, so now you're going to travel at the speed of light, um, and you're going to travel at the speed of light for one year, right? So at the end of one year, how far have you moved through space? One light year. One year. How far have you moved through time? Zero. You have not. You have not moved through time. Time does not occur for anything moving at the speed of light, right? So now we'll do a little bit of both, right? So we're going to travel, um, you know, at this diagonal distance, doing a little bit of both, um, moving not quite uh, at the speed of light, uh, and then at the end of a year, only about seven tenths of a year have gone by, and we've moved about seven tenths of a light year. Sounds pretty good, right? Easy to get your head around. Well, it would be <laughs> if light worked on the, if, if space time worked on the geometry of a circle, right? Um, this is, light does not work on, on the, um, on the geometry of a circle, it works on the geometry of a hyperbola, actually, we saw that in the last presentation. Uh, hyperbola came up again. But the reason I use this inaccurate concept is because you get the idea that you're trading a little bit of one thing for a little bit of the other thing, and you're getting up this, this blended value. Now remember that I was honest, so, so that was the line, by the way. Um, uh, the geometry of the circle was the line part. Um, the space-time interval equation that I showed you earlier, that was not a line, that's actually the correct equation. Um, and then my little bit of humor, uh, hyperbolas, right? So it's hyperbolas or hyperbolae, just not hyperbole. Uh, so, okay, so here's the space-time interval again, but I've removed the radical symbol by squaring both sides of the equation. So I'm squaring this bit on the left, and I'm squaring this whole bit on the right, um, and I've also moved the one over C over here uh, instead of over here, right? So I'm playing around with the, the math a little bit to get it into this form. And the reason I want it to be in this form is because I want to show you another equation. This is the equation for a hyperbola. K squared is Y squared minus X squared, right? So I've got something squared, right, the, the orange bits, equals something squared, the, the violet bits, minus something squared, the green bits. It's the same equation, right? The same, the same formula for the equation essentially is being done. It's just the values that I'm dropping in are a little bit different. So space-time is actually bending based on the math of a hyperbola. Okay, so with that, um, we'll take the space-time interval again. I'll draw it up again. And remember that C is the constant that represents the speed of light. Now here's, here's the bit, right? So C could be 299,792,458.0 meters per second. Anybody know why it's 0? Oh, surely you know why. Surely you know why. It's, somebody in this room knows why it's 0. Defined. Because we redefined the meter. <laughs> we cheated. <laughs> so it wasn't point zero, and it's, I want to say it was 1983. Um, they said, hey, uh, Instead of using a stick in France, um, let's base it on, off of, of uh, some concept in physics. And so um, they redefined the, uh, the length of a meter to be 1, 299,792, 458 of a light year. Is, 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 I don't know. Get a, get a calculator. <laughs> so, I'm not doing Oh, um, I think it was actually more than a meter that it changed. It wasn't, it wasn't like they just took it and, and moved it to the nearest round off value. There was something they did that actually, because I actually did do some research. I, I don't remember what the old value was, but it was just a couple of meters that it changed by. But it wasn't, I, I expected it to be. It, 
If, oh, I'm sorry. If you actually have a meter stick, how long did the meter stick change? Yeah. You can't. You can't see the difference because it's. Okay. Yeah. It's, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about the entire light year, not one meter stick. Yeah. In a. Um, it, the length of the meter stick. It's like you know. I don't think you, if you if, if you took a file and, and, and gave it just one brush at the end, you you probably shaved off too much already. Uh, but uh, but the entire light year. Uh, this digit at the end changed by more than one value. Um, so I don't know why. I thought they would just knock off anything it's after the decimal point. It'd be but three, three parts in a billion. Yeah, right. So you know, an insignificant change, but it's now based on the speed of light. And so that's why uh, this is a precise number and not a round off number. Uh, could be 186, 282, and it's, and, and, and it's point and a lot of noise. Um, that is a rounded off value. That's not a precise uh, number. But, and this is, the, this is the part that you should remember. So, C is, all speeds are some unit of distance over some period of time. Some unit of distance over some period of time. And here's, here's the magic one that we want. Some distance over some period of time. And so, in this unit over time, it's one. And since it's one, so C can be one, right? As long as we're doing light years per year. So remember I showed you that graph and I said you're gonna see why I used years on one axis and light years on the other axis. Um, it's because if I use years and light years, I'm allowed to make this one. If I make that a one, well that's one over one, which is one. And one times whatever that is, is just whatever that is, which means I can just scratch that out and not even do the mass, right? So now it's just delta S squared, delta T squared, and delta X squared. So that makes it really easy. All right. So here's why you all have, does everybody have a piece of graph paper? Yep. Okay, great. So here's why you all have the graph paper. Um, so I'm gonna show you how to do this without any math at all. So you all have a piece of graph paper in front of you that looks like this. Um, so hyperbola intersects each unit. So remember the hyperbola is, so if this is one unit up, it would be, it's actually one squared equals blah, blah, blah. So that's where k is one squared, k is two squared, k is three squared, and so on, right? Um, it's not just one, two, and three, otherwise the math doesn't work, but, um, so here are a series of um, hyperbole uh, going through. And the asymptote toward this 45 degree angle, so the, that's the asymptote there. Um, asymptote, for the refresher, means they get incredibly close without ever actually touching. Um, the line never truly goes flat. Um, so we'll put an origin point here, that'll represent our uh, stationary observer. Uh, C is this orange line, that is the speed of light. So if you can travel the speed of light, you are moving along your orange line. And the y-axis, we'll use that to represent our zeros, and the x-axis we'll use to represent our light years. Okay, so here's the non-math example. I'm going to zoom in so that it's not so much of a strain on your eyes. We'll just drop it to 10 minutes only. And we'll pick two people. I made up the names. I'm not very original, so I'll call them Mary. And I think I call the other person Bob. Yeah, Bob. There it is. Mary and Bob. Great. Bob is going to travel at two-thirds the speed of light. So remember in your geometry class, if you want to do a two-thirds angle, you can go over two, up three, or you can go over three and up two. If I went over three and up two, then I'd be dealing with this section of the graph down here. I wanted to be up here, so I went, uh, you know, over two, up three that way. So uh, this line is over two, up three, over two, up three, over two, up three, um, and, and and so on. And then I draw a line to that slope. Okay, so there's my slope of three halves. Mary thinks Bob's gone for ten years. Okay, so this is uh, Mary's point of reference here. So we'll add Mary's vertical slope, which is this green line. So Mary's not moving, right? So Mary's not moving, so we do not move her through the distance, but we do move her through time. And after 10 years, Mary is now at this point in our space-time graph. So this is Mary's 10-year event, <laughs> all right? Uh, the question is, and Bob has been going at two-thirds of the speed of light, that's this line here. The speed of light is the orange line there. So the question is, how much time has elapsed for Bob? All right? And the answer is, uh, to find this, we have to find the event where Bob's slope inter uh, is level with Mary's 10-year point. So we draw a line here, and I highlighted that spot there. 
So this is the, the target point that we're trying to get to. Now, a year passes every time a hyperbola, right, because these are the hyperbolas, intersects that line. So if there's one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, it'll be six years there, it'll be seven years there. Now, eight years is up there, but that's above Mary's 10-year point, so he doesn't make it to eight years. He only makes it to about seven and a half, and if you squint, an argument could be made that it's not quite seven and a half. All right. So, just using hyperbolic graph paper, you decide what fraction of the speed of light you want to go at, you plot the line, and then you decide how many years your stationary observer is going to be stationary, you come across find the intersection, and all you do is count these dots, just count the intersections, and you're done. So, this means that Bob thinks that it's been about seven and a half years. Also, uh, are we correct? Okay, so to find out if we're correct, uh, looks like Bob's gone seven and a half years. We drop a line here, down to here, and say, okay, at two thirds of the speed of light, looks like Bob has gone six and two thirds light years. Now that makes sense, because he's going two thirds of the speed of light for 10 years. So he should be that far away. So Bob believes he has traveled six and two thirds light years, but he believes he's done it in seven and a half years' time, which does not, uh, that doesn't jive with Mary's idea that he's been gone for 10 light years. Or, I'm sorry, he's been gone for 10 years. Um, that's what Mary thinks. So we can try out the math. So here's our equation, and we'll plug in some terms. Anybody have a calculator? If anybody wants to play along, you can do this. So remember, this is just one over one, so we can ignore it. So it's 10 squared, that's 100, minus 6.66 squared. Anybody want to do this? I, I can do the math if you want. All right, and uh, pull up the calculator, flip it sideways so that it's in scientific mode, and uh, it's 100 minus 6.66 squared. I get 55.644. Now that doesn't sound right, but remember, 55.644 is not the answer, it's the square of the answer. So I have to hit the square root button, which on my calculator is there, and I get 7.459, right? So 7.45, that's just under seven and a half years, and that's the answer, right? So it turns out this actually works. You can just use graph paper, uh, just remember that it works on the math, on the geometry of hyperbolas, and uh, you can use graph papers to estimate it. You can do this for anything you want. Okay, so we're not really done with the presentation yet, but um, one of the mind-blowing concepts that I want you to take away. The reason you cannot travel faster than the speed of light is because you effectively are already moving at this speed of space-time. And the difference is how much of your motion through space-time, so space and time are inextricably linked, you can't separate one from the other. Uh, the difference is how far are you going through time versus how far are you going through space, right? But you're always going that constant speed. So if you accelerate, um, you'll start, your, your distance number will start going up, but your time value will start going down. And always by a way in which that equation will be true. The constant will never change. Um, so that's the notion there. Uh, a couple of misconceptions. Um, one misconception that I've heard is that um, the reason you can't uh, travel uh, at the speed of light is because mass increases toward infinity as objects approach the speed of light. That's actually not true. Um, something called relativistic mass is what increases uh, toward infinity, not actual mass. So your actual mass doesn't change, but your relativistic mass does. Um, some stuff that, and if I have time, I can bring it up at the end or in questions or something. Einstein basically works out that um, inertia and gravity are basically linked. And uh, so it is as if your mass is increasing toward in infinity. What's actually happened is inertial resistance is increasing toward infinity, and so you need an infinite amount of energy to go just a tiny bit faster. If you have no mass at all, you can go the speed of light. So things like photons get to go the speed of light. 
Um, but if you have any mass at all, no matter how little, you can't go the speed of light. You have to do something less than that. Um, so massless particles down here that I mentioned. All right. Um, while I was outside the Michigan Science Center uh, doing an outreach event, um, a young lady came up to me and said, well, you know that, that this relativity idea has all been dispelled uh, and it doesn't work. Um, I, I assure you it has not been dispelled. Uh, it has been proven numerous different ways. I actually didn't think of this example at the time, and I wish I had, right? Um, anybody not know what a GPS is or <laughs> not <laughs> use one like in your life? <laughs> okay. So um, I think everybody has, has used one of these things at least once, uh, and some, some of us use them daily, right? Um, so some interesting things that happen. So the satellites are actually hurling through space at about 14,000 kilometers per hour. This results in a clock, so cesium clocks on these things. Cesium clocks are losing about seven microseconds per 24-hour day, well, 24-hour Earth day. Um, so when a 24-hour Earth day has elapsed to the cesium clock, seven microseconds less than a 24-hour Earth day have, have elapsed. Um, that's due to the effects of essentially special relativity. Um, but general relativity, which I didn't really talk about, is that as you get closer to a strong gravitational field, your clock slows down. While the satellites are not closer to the gravitational field, they're farther from the gravitational field. They're about 20,000 kilometers above. And so when you calculate the effects of general relativity, the clocks gain 45 microseconds in a day. This works out to a net gain, so 45 minus 7, 38 microseconds a day, that the clocks seem to be running fast. So uh, when a 24-hour day has elapsed for us, the GPS satellite thinks a 24-hour day plus 38 microseconds um, has elapsed. Now it's 38 microseconds. I mean, come on. Microsecond. And so milliseconds are thousandths of a second, a microsecond is a millionth of a second. So 38 millionths of a second, right? That can't be much. But remember, we're talking about radio wave propagation, which is occurring at the speed of light, which is a constant through a vacuum. So how far can something travel in 38 microseconds if it's going to the speed of light? And the answer is more than 10,000 kilometers. The actual number that I calculated is 11,392 kilometers. So, in one 24-hour day, if you don't do something about this problem, your GPS is going to have this incredible, actually, okay, hold on a second, error on the slide. That's supposed to be meters, <laughs> not kilometers. That's 10 kilometers or 10,000 meters, so that's an error. So type on the slide, I just realized, like, wait a minute, that's wrong. Um, you're going to be off by a, a, a better than 10 kilometers. Um, so, okay, so if I'm trying to navigate to uh, the WAS meeting here at Cranbrook, I'm going to end up 10 kilometers someplace else after just one day, and the error is additive. So tomorrow it will be worse. At the end of the month, it will be significantly worse than that, right? So um, 10 kilometers in one day, actually 11 kilometers in one day, right? So um, in a month, 30 days, we're off by uh, over 300 kilometers. So I could end up going to the WAS meeting and, and arriving in Chicago. Um, so this system isn't going to work very well if we put it into orbit and within a month uh, people are ending up in the wrong city. Um, so that's the, um, the, the GPS example. So inside your GPS, um, there is some math that is done to calculate for the effects of relativity. And if you do not do this math, it doesn't work out right. Um, so the next example, um, by the way, anybody listen to the great courses plus those great, great, so I love these things, right? So there's loads, of, so this is one that I got from one of the great courses uh, professors, um, pions. So pions are pi mesons, they're easy to create particle accelerators, but they decay basically instantly, right? 26 billionths of a second, so which is like nothing. Um, if you accelerate to 99.9% .9 of the speed of light and do the math, um, so the question is, in 26 billionths of a second, how far does light travel? Now, I didn't do the math for how, how far light travels, but it turns out uh, the Gavin Gray courses did. Um, so if relativity is incorrect, so if Einstein is wrong, in 26 billionths of a second, 
a particle at 99.9% .9 of the speed of light will travel about 25 feet. Right? But if Einstein is right, the clock on that pion, its, it's pocket watch, uh, is running slow. So slow that in our reference frame for space time, um, it will make it 557 feet in just what it thinks is 26 billionths of a second. So you do an experiment. You go into a particle accelerator and you put some detectors at different distances from your origin point and you test it out. How far can you go? And so the question is, does the pion go 25 feet or does the pion go 557 feet or does the pion go some, something in the middle? And the answer is, 557 feet. They've actually done this experiment. Um, so it does actually work. Um, so that's essentially it in a nutshell. I didn't talk about the effects of, of general relativity. Uh, allow me to just add the, the bit that I left out, because when I did this for the Ford talk, there was no time. Um, essentially imagine four reference frames. And Einstein's great idea was he's walking out of an office and he sees a building and there's a scaffolding around the building. And in the um, scaffolding, scaffolding where these guys would do construction, he says, what would happen if one of these guys, like, his, he calls it the happiest thought of his life, by the way. What would happen if one of these workers falls off the scaffolding along with their toolbox? I'm like, really? This is the happiest thought of your life? Sounds kind of morbid. But, but his like, aha moment was um, that in this, in this moment, both the worker and the toolbox think that they're falling at the same rate and they do not experience gravity. This leads him to come up with these four different reference frames. So two of the reference frames, you experience no, no gravity. In one of the reference frames, we need to find a place that has no gravity. So where do I want to go to experience no gravity? Do I want to go to the International Space Station? No, the International Space Station experiences tremendous amounts of gravity. The International uh, Space Station is not in weightlessness, it's falling, there is a difference. So you are falling around the Earth, and the space station, while you are inside it, are falling at precisely the, sp the same speed, right? So you've got that uh, acceleration due to the effects of gravity. But if I place myself trillions of miles away from the nearest star, effectively the gravity from everything around would be so weak that while technically non-zero, it's so close to zero, we could just say it's zero. So I'm going to put my laboratory trillions of miles away from any planet um, in the middle of space. And I'm inside this box. I have no windows, so I don't know where I am. Uh, and I've got other objects with me that I can do experiments with. I've got a laboratory. Uh, so if I just want something, um, you know, a tennis ball or something, and I let go of it, it just floats in the air as long as while I'm floating in the air. Now, if you could move this laboratory to the atmosphere of Earth, and drop it and just pretend that actually there's no air, so there's no resistance. Um, the person in the laboratory is not in zero gravity, they're in gravity, but they're falling, but they're falling at exactly the same rate, and they can't look out any windows. So they cannot tell um, that they're falling in one reference frame versus floating with no gravity in the other reference frame. You can take another set of two where the laboratory is just sitting on the ground not moving, here on the stage. 9.8 meters per, we can round it off, 10 meters a second squared, right? About 9.8 meters per second squared, the effects of gravity. But I could also put my laboratory trillions of miles from Earth, put a rocket underneath it, and accelerate the rocket engine so that the laboratory is shooting up 9.8 meters per second squared. And I, and I don't have any windows, so I can't tell if I'm sitting on the ground versus out in this floating um, laboratory. And so Einstein says there's no experiment that you can do to figure out one versus the other. Now here's the freaky bit. This is the part I never heard before in my life. What if you put a radio transmitter on the floor and a radio receiver on the ceiling of your laboratory and beamed a radio signal from the floor to the ceiling? What you would notice in the accelerating reference frame is that there's a Doppler shift from the radio signal. Oh wait a minute, so if I do this on Earth, I'm not gonna experiment, or I'm not gonna experience a Doppler shift, right? So, aha, I found the experiment that's going to find out so this is the experiment that breaks it, right? It turns out it doesn't break. If I do the same experiment in the laboratory on Earth, there's also a Doppler shift. And the Doppler shift is due to what they call gravitational Doppler shift. So gravity literally is trying to steal energy from the photon as it's leaving 
The speed of light doesn't change, so it goes at the same speed, but what happens is it redshifts the energy. The number of oscillations that it does slows down. That's essentially the photon is giving up energy by oscillating less often, shifting toward the red side of the spectrum. So in one way, you're shifting toward the red side because you're actually moving away, and the other one, you're shifting, oh, your, your spectrum is shifting because you're in a gravitational field. And this is the aha moment when Einstein says, gravity has the same effect. And, and so that's essentially how you get to general relativity. So I just want to inject that point. Um, that was a bit that I didn't have time to include. Uh, any questions? Anybody? anybody? Um, your times are for uh, uh, moving the vacuum. What about interposing matter? Um, you like light moving through air, light moving through water. Or glass or something. Or, yeah, something that, right. So I, I didn't do any, you know, obviously you can get light to move at different speeds through different materials. Um, I haven't read any papers on, on experiments with this. Obviously, we know that you can get light to slow down uh, through different mediums. Uh, but the, you know, does this break relativity, right? Can you, can you do an experiment, you know, with moving through matter that isn't a vacuum and, and cause? I don't think so. Uh, my understanding is that we've done confirmation of relativity at least 60 completely different ways that have confirmed that relativity is real. And so far, no experiments have shown um, that it's not real and that, that Einstein's equations are wrong or even need to be tweaked. Yeah? Mass. You were talking about mass increasing or mass increasing relative... relative Relativistic mass. mass. Inertia, essentially, yeah. Technically, can you just give a little brief understanding? I'm Lost. So the, the example that I give, all right, so, so keep in mind that I, I try and explain this stuff to eighth graders, and I, although this is a little bit above an eighth grade level, but I try and give this stuff to eighth graders, and I also, when I do public outreaches, I, I try and explain this. And so here's the, here's the analogy I give to them. Go to your local grocery store, grab a shopping cart. Now the shopping cart is empty because you've just walked into the store. So although this is pretty easy to start the shopping cart, it's pretty easy to stop the shopping cart. Um, and when you get to the end of the aisle and you want to do a U-turn so you can go up the next aisle, it's pretty easy to make the turn. Now, toward the end of your shopping expedition, let's say you bought lots of heavy things that you put in the shopping cart, so maybe you bought 10 cases of bottled water because you're a little thirsty. Um, so now it's a heavy shopping cart. Suddenly it's kind of difficult to get that shopping cart to move. Um, also, once you get it moving, uh, if you're about to crash into something, you've got to put some muscle into it to stop that shopping cart. The other effect that you notice is that when you're getting to the end of the aisle and you're trying to round the corner, it's difficult to turn. The shopping cart wants to go straight. These are the effects of inertia. And uh, the, so this is another one of those things that Aristotle got not quite right, which was that all objects want to come to a stop because to Aristotle, you could take, you know, something round and roll it, and it rolls for a little bit, and it stops. Um, Aristotle did not understand that those were the effects of friction, um, and that uh, if you could eliminate the effects of friction, it would just keep going and going and going, right? So later on, we, we figured that stuff out. Um, but all of the forces of inertia work out to be the same as the forces of gravity. Um, the guy who kind of gets credit for working this out uh, is Galileo. So in Galileo's time, if you go to a cathedral, they didn't have lights, so they actually had to light candles. The chandeliers were kind of high up. Uh, rather than climbing all the way up, the easy thing to do was to lower them down to the ground, light them, and then hoist them back up, where, of course, they're going to be rocking back and forth like pendulums. And what Galileo notices is um, he expects that large, massive chandeliers with a lot more lights would be swinging more slowly than tiny chandeliers with fewer lights. And he notices that this is not the case. Uh, the case is um, the length of the, the, the pendulum's arm, right? That's what makes the difference. And so what he ultimately works out is that it is true that the more massive object is experiencing uh, more, more, gravity, more gravity, right? So if I take the 100-pound cannonball and the 1-pound cannonball and I drop them both, the 100-pound cannonball has a stronger gravitational pull to the Earth. That is true. So it, we logically conclude it should fall faster because it is heavier. 
but there is inertia. So the 100 pound cannonball is more massive and like the shopping cart, it does not want to change speeds. It wants to stay at the same speed. It takes more energy to change its speed. Now the light cannonball has a weaker force, but it's not hard to change its speed because it weighs so much less. And so this is what Galileo works out, is that there is a linkage. And so Galileo had actually worked out that inertia and uh, gravity were equal to at least one part in a thousand. And then later years, uh, we've realized that it's actually astonishingly more accurate than that. And, and then Einstein basically said they're linked. Oh, I got it. Yep. Other questions? I, can, I think I think I say the room is dark. Actually, if you want to bring up the lights a little bit, yeah, we can bring up the lights. Yeah, um, I tried to find a good explanation for the fluid paradox. You know, Bob thinks Mary's moving. Mary oh yeah. But maybe that's too much for this discussion. But I don't, I just can't reconcile. I looked at Google. I just can't the reconcile. only explanation I've heard about the, the the twin paradox that made sense was that um, in the twin paradox you have to do a U turn and come back, and that messes up everything. Uh, but if you, if, if somehow, you know, you could travel only in one direction for a while and stop, uh, it would be different. Um, but uh, the idea is that, yeah, these two people are experiencing time uh, at different rates, and they really do. Yeah. I was going to say that acceleration and deceleration is called a boost. Okay. Okay? Yeah. And you have to accelerate, turn around, and decelerate. Yes. And then do the same thing to come back. And that's where all the time dilation occurs. Um, yeah, so um, I'm not sure if I completely follow you. Um, so I haven't actually done any digging into the, the twin paradox, other than I've I've heard it doesn't quite work out the way people expected it to, but, but what I did here is that it's because you're not actually just traveling at the speed of light and not stopping. You're like stopping, doing a U-turn, and then coming back, and I'm told that's what messes up everything. That that's why it doesn't work out the way you would expect it to. It's because you're doing I mean, a U-turn. You have to start from zero, Yeah. and you have to, and you have to turn around right. someplace, yep. and then you have to come back. Yes. Something about simultaneous, simultaneous, I can't say that word, simultaneous. Yeah, I, I just make up the words. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thinking, <laughs> thank you, Tim. <laughs>